G'day, my name is Nick Bowditch. Welcome to today's episode of the Reboot Your Thinking podcast. Uh, this is the podcast that um, reimagines mindset, mindfulness, and mental health from the perspective of someone who gives and gets therapy. Uh, today's episode is about building resilience, how to bounce back from setbacks. And it's a really important one today because a lot of people talk about resilience and a lot of people sort of get on themselves about not being able to have it or not having enough of it or not showing it quick enough or whatever. And other people say, you know, you just got to be resilient. Why aren't you resilient? And, you know, it's difficult. It's not just something that everyone can tap into equally or as readily accessible for everybody. And and there's tips, there's ways that you can build it. It's not It's not a gift. It's something that you build. It's something that you work on, it's something that you uncover. And, uh, and we're going to talk a bit about that today, how to bounce back from a setback by tapping into um, our own resilience. So starting with what is resilience and, and why is it important, right? So resilience is the ability to adapt and cope with stress and adversity and setbacks in life, things that don't go our way. Um, and it's, it's a, it's an innate thing for a lot of people. It's something that people, some people you look at it and you sort of marvel at their level of resilience. Like, how are you doing this? How were you able to come back from that? Whatever it might be. And for other people, you can sort of think, well, why aren't you just getting over this? Why aren't you getting past it? Why aren't you tapping into your resilience to get through, through this stuff? And the truth of it is that it's not... It's not given to us all in equal parts. It's not uh, as equally accessible for everybody. Everybody has it, right? It's there. It, it, in some level, it's in us, in all of us. But how much we access it, how quickly and, and how able we are to access it, um, how much of it we can access it and how much we can then build once we have um, depends very much on the individual and the amount of work that we put in. There's that word again. We've got to do the work, right? And, and part of the doing the work, part of resilience is being able to have good self-awareness, being able to have good self-compassion, um, being able to be grateful for things. We'll, we'll cover all this um, in this session. But the truth of it is that resilience is very important for our for our mental and our physical health. Um, it's important for our relationships. It's important for our friendships, for our bonding and attachment. Um, and it's important for our success in life. So let's let's start today with um, understanding the setbacks, right? And so, and, and really just the role of our mindset in this um, and how we can maybe be aware of the setback, how we can be aware of our our ability to to you know to combat it, to fight against it, to come back from it, um, and so on. So there's certain sort of you know there's there's common types of setbacks, right? So um, you lose your job, a relationship breakup, a friendship breakdown, a, a chronic illness, um, whatever failure you whatever you perceive as being failure, your your recognition of failure, right? And all these sort of common setbacks all have a very similar common underlying thing. And it's that you were trying for something and now you can't have it. You, you know, you were, you were aiming for something and you've had a setback in the pursuit of that. What, whatever it might be, that's the underlying theme, right? And that's the way that we access or we don't access um, resilience, right? So the role of mindset in this is how we perceive those setbacks and, and how we react to them, right? Do they, are they something which is going to kick us in the ass and hold us down for a long time? Or are they something where we go, yeah, you know, I really wanted that, but didn't, I really wanted that job, but I, but I didn't get it and life goes on, right? So the mindset and which mindset we attack our life and individual parts of our life really matter here, right? So there's two kind of things that you, if you consume a bit of this sort of content, you'll, you'll, these things will be, you'll know these terms, right? So there's either a fixed or a growth mindset. So the fixed mindset says, well, I'm a failure and there's nothing I can do about that. Like I just have to accept that or 
oh, it's just it's just the way I am or it's just the way I've always been or because of what happened to me when I was a kid, this is what I do as an adult. Um, you know, all those things come from a bit of a, a fixed mindset. And, and I'm reminded of my, my great sort of motto, the thing that I live by. And it's, it's my saying that's in my head all the time. And it's one, of, um, it's one from Carl Jung, who's my kind of, Carl Jung is my Harry Styles, really. Uh, and Jung said, you know, um, I'm not what happened to me, I'm what I choose to become. And I think it's a really powerful thing to keep that in my head. You know, I, I'm not the trauma. I'm not the fuck ups. I'm not the poor decisions. I'm not the relationship breakdowns. I, I'm not the mistakes. I'm, you know, uh, I'm what I choose to become out of those things, past those things, because of those things. And that's a really, really important thing for me. And, and, and I think probably for you. You know, so that's the difference between those things. So the fixed mindset says, I'm a failure, I can't do anything about it, that's just the way it is. And a growth mindset says, well, I can learn from this and I can come back stronger, right? And for a lot of people, it's just the fixed, right, down the line. They can't really get past that, I can't change, I, I can't build, I can't be resilient, there's nothing to be resilient from or to because this is where I am. This is my mindset. Whereas that growth mindset says, all right, all right, I've made a mistake. I've made loads of mistakes, um, but I can learn from them. I can rebound from them. I can tap into my resilience and I can build myself back from that. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So there's a few strategies and tools that, that, that kind of really help um, in this Build, in this recognition of, of the mindset of a setback and then the building back from that mindset, so from that setback. So I just want you to keep in mind, you, you might be thinking, you might be listening to this thing because you are trying to come back from a setback. So I want you to think of all that right in, in the moment, like put everything in the theme of that, put everything in the context of what you're trying to be resilient from and to and, and see if we can sort of tap into that today and hopefully give you some strategies to come out of it. The first thing, the first tip and strategy, as it almost always is with all of my shit, is mindfulness, is to be aware, to be mindful of what has happened, what might happen, what will happen if I change things, what has happened to me before and what feelings I have around that and when I have those feelings, what I generally have done with them in the past. Um, all of those things come from a mindful presence, from being in the moment, from being able to turn down the volume of all the other crazy stuff going on in your head and being able to say, all right, uh, it's not, that's not important to me. What is important to me is this, what's happening now. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I want. This is what I want to change. This is what I want to do. This is how I'm going to do it. All of those things arise from being able to practice mindfulness. Now, mindfulness for me, is a type of meditation that I do. It's it's a focus that it's a real concentrated focus that I have. So I have to have that because I have a lot of moving parts in my head and I have a lot of things that I can't necessarily control in my head. So I have to turn the volume of those down and turn the volume up of what I really, really want to focus and center myself on. For other people it's less meditative and it's more kind of it's just their way of being you know they're a very mindful person they're very aware of what's going on around them and and their place in it and for some people there's no mindfulness at all they're just not mindful they're not present in that um, they're not able to hone in on really what's happening in that moment um, they're too distracted or or happily distracted by all the other stuff so they don't necessarily need to focus on one particular thing so Mindfulness is really important. It's a really good strategy to be able to build your resilience. It's kind of step one for me. Step two then is self-care. You know, um, you'll hear a lot of the same sort of themes from me because they work, right? When you care for yourself, you're able to first sense that something's not quite right, that you've had a setback or you're heading towards one. Um, and the self-care puts you in a spot where you're like, all right, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to build back out of this. I can build back out of this. Uh, and sometimes we just, you know, 
sometimes you're just not able to. Sometimes you're just not able to even recognize that. And, and I think those times are when we're really not caring for ourselves. We're not producing that level of self-care that we need, that we all need, right? So self-care can, can happen in lots of different ways. And I think self-care, the, the notion of self-care has been bastardized a bit. It's been sex in the city a bit where it means you know, you've got to spend money on yourself or you've got to buy new, some new shoes or you've got to have a massage and stuff. And all of those things work, right, if that's your, if that's your gig. But I think you know, self-care can be as simple as being mindful of what's going on around you, how you speak about yourself, being kind to yourself and to others. Like all those things still count as self-care to me as much as the $300, pair, $300 pair of shoes. So, you know, I think self-care is really important. I also think that it's a particularly often neglected part of our routine um, as humans. And I think that's sad. I think that's a wasted opportunity. So, yeah, self-care is really important too to be able to first step into that that resilience, to first tap into it and then to build from it. Thirdly then is social support. So I'm someone who would more than happily just live on my island with the very, very few people that I really want to care about and really care for me and ignore the rest of the world and that would be great, thanks. Like that is... That is heaven to me and um, so I, I have some social anxiety, I have some issues with social phobia that I'm not really great with, even though I do stand on stage in front of a thousand people and talk about my innermost shit, that is a completely different environment for me for some reason. The one-on-one, one-on-two, one-on-four sort of communication is, ugh, is not great for me. But I also can recognize that social support is super important to me and necessary for me to display resilience, for me to recognize setback, for me to be able to have self-care in some ways. It relies on my social support. I do need people around me. Everybody needs people around them. Even if you're an ignorant pig like me and don't want any of that around you, we still recognize that, that that's really what's needed and necessary for growth and certainly for resilience. So social support is really important. Having people around you who won't judge you, people around you who will accept you, people around you who will allow you to care for yourself um, and allow you to put yourself first, which is really important and really hard to find, actually. So if you can find those people, hang on to them with dear life. So then the last one is gratitude. Now, I know there'll be some eye rolling when I say that because it's a real kind of buzzword of self-help, you know, the old gratitude, but there's a reason for that. It fucking works, right? It works. When you are, when you are mindfully grateful of something, you become mindfully grateful of everything. When you write down how grateful you are, when you make a gratitude list, when you write down something that you're grateful for, you are more grateful for it. That's, it's scientifically proven. It's a way to forge a new neural pathway that says that gratitude is more open to me, that I'm more open to good stuff happening to me because I'm grateful for it, because I'm thankful for it. I appreciate it. These things really work. And if you think about someone in your life who's, who is just consistently miserable, and consistently negative, unable to grow, in a very, very fixed mindset, then they're almost certainly never displaying any gratitude. Certainly not to you, but probably not to themselves either, and not to the greater community outside of you both. Gratitude is super important. It is something that helps steer our life into a better spot. And I can't stress enough how important it is to, to be able to at least just wake up, open your eyes in the morning and go, oh, I'm grateful for today. I'm grateful that I've opened my eyes, that I'm able to choose now what I do for the day, if you are. It's super important to be grateful for that. And then at the end of the day, to be able to go, okay, some things were really shit today, but today I'm really grateful for this, this and this. When you say it out loud, when you write it down, you become more grateful for those things and you become more, uh, gratitude becomes more readily accessible to you. It's, I'm not, that's not my opinion. That's not magic. It's science, right? So I'd really import, like, I just think it's super, super important. Then there's the importance of self-compassion, right? And self-acceptance in, in the whole building of resilience thing. 
it's really something that that gets overlooked because I think as kids, if you're the same age as me, in the same sort of generational concept as me, or a bit older even, then you were told that the world doesn't revolve around you. There's no need to be wallowing in your self-pity. Get over it. Um, You know, self-compassion was discouraged. Uh, And so for us, it's very difficult to be compassionate of yourself. It's very difficult to accept yourself because you're, you're constantly judging yourself or comparing yourself to, to other people. You're constantly trying to seek other people's approval, other people's acceptance instead of our own. You know, it's very, very difficult to be compassionate to yourself to say, do you know what? I did fuck that up. I have made that mistake. I did the wrong thing there. Um, that doesn't mean I am wrong. It doesn't mean I am a fuck up, right? It doesn't mean I am a mistake. It means I made mistakes. And there's a very big difference between that. That's the difference between guilt and shame, of course, is that guilt says, you know, I did something bad. I did a bad thing. And shame says, no, no, you, you are bad. There's, there's, that's the fixed mindset stuff, right? So self-compassion and self-acceptance is very, very important in building resilience. You're building, trying to build resilience because you've had a setback, right? Now, if you have no self-compassion, And if you have no self-acceptance or at least a distorted version of that, then whatever the setback is that you're trying to be resilient from, you're also probably saying, I'm responsible for it. And you might be, right? And I'm not saying you're not responsible for any mistakes. What I'm saying is, even if you are the whole and solely only responsible person for that setback or for that mistake, then be compassionate about it. As compassionate as you would be to someone else. You know, it's true that we would never say half of the stuff, half of the negative bad stuff that we say to ourselves in our head. We would never in a million years say that to someone else. And yet, you know, we lack, if we lack that self-compassion, that's exactly what we're doing. We're on ourselves hard about our mistakes and we're not letting up on that. Now, if you don't let up on that, resilience is a futile aim, honestly. You're never going to get there, Right that self-compassion is is really important so try and we'll we'll go some tips on that in a sec but you know that self-compassion and self-acceptance is is the only way to build resilience right it's not a, a strategic tip along the way it's the only way so that's that's kind of makes up the mindset of it and that's how you know that's how you thrive that's how you come back from that and whether you're you know Um, someone one of my clients who displays some resilience coming back from setbacks and we talk about that a lot in therapy with with my clients you know things that marriage breakdowns um, job losses mistakes that they've made that they can't forgive themselves for Um, and even you know things that they've just been an innocent bystander in that they haven't done anything wrong and yet they can't seem to tap into the resilience to come out of that Um, that's really important whether you can take advantage uh, take uh, example from you know people that everyday people that i work with or famous people you know there's lots of different famous people who've displayed resilience and that's kind of part of their fame you know as australians we have Tria pitt who is just an amazing um example of resilience Tria was uh, an endurance athlete is an endurance athlete who um, suffered severe burns you know, to, to most of her body during a bush, uh, bushfire uh, where she was doing an ultramarathon. And she was told, you know, she would never walk again. She would certainly never run again or even have full use of her arms again. But since then, of course, she's competed in you know, lots and lots of different races, triathlons and ultramarathons, and is now an author of a really, really great book that I highly recommend and, uh, and a motivational speaker like me. And... She is an amazing, amazing Australian who's somehow tapped into that resilience. And she is a great example of the self-compassion and the self-acceptance, right? A really great example. And the social support. She has a really great family and a really great support network around her who helped build her back up and helped her build herself back up. Another example would be Adam Goods, um, who's, you know, was an Indigenous footy player um, who went through horrific uh experience towards the end of his career where he was 
racially vilified and abused and booed and discriminated against during his whole career, but certainly at the end. And the resilience that he showed from that to, to once he retired to building um, the platform around um, racism in footy and in sport in general and in Australia in general um, to promoting uh, First Nations culture and re- reconciliation, like, he's the man, <laughs> You know, like he has shown incredible gratitude, incredible kindness, you know, to be able to come out of a situation where he was shown none um, and still shown kindness and still displayed kindness, you know. Um, Nelson Mandela, another great example, not Australian, but certainly someone who has definitely shown no kindness and maintained kindness and maintained empathy and maintained a sense of self-compassion and compassion for others including his his captors you know including the people who persecuted him to a point where he was then able to hone that and steer that into leadership and and you know whether you choose the famous people to be um to gain example from or just people in your own life or yourself self-acceptance self-compassion is the key and whether you can find that where however you find that that's what you have to find to be able to really start to build the resilience to then overcoming obstacles so there's a few common challenges though too that that get in the way of resilience and things like fear and shame and well let's start with them like so fear is is a big one fear is very limiting and we all have these kind of um core fears that that we are not enough that we're not good enough that we're not smart enough that we're not good looking enough we're not tall enough we're not rich enough we're not whatever it might be right anytime we start a negative thought in our head which starts with i am it's usually you know i am too fat i am too poor i am too dumb i you know whatever i am invisible i am unworthy i am unlovable Um, whatever those fears are, most often they're not true for a start. And secondly, most often they are defeatable. You know, we can attack those and we can can tap into resilience and rebound from those. My two favorite, just speaking personally, my two favorite ones of those for me is I am unlovable and I am unworthy. Now, I know that those things, intellectually, I know that they're not true. I know that I'm I'm not unworthy because everything that I've achieved and built and and have in life, I've I've worked fucking hard for and I've made lots of sacrifices and I've made lots of mistakes along the way to getting it. And I know that I'm I'm not unlovable because I know my kids love me. I know people love me. They say they love me. (laughs) You know, I, I can only take that. I can only take people at what they say I can only take my kids affection and love for what it is I know that I'm not unlovable yet my two very strongest core beliefs are that I'm unworthy and that I'm unlovable and that they're just not true but that doesn't mean I don't feel it that doesn't mean it doesn't affect me you know they they still very much are true in my in my head different times so I have to overcome those things right and and that's a fear for me you know, those common, those core beliefs are fears, things that I'm frightened of. And you might be frightened of things too. And I'm not talking about, you know, snakes and clowns and things that everyone should be frightened of. I, I mean, you know, I fear being successful. I fear being alone. I, I fear making a mistake that is going to alter the course of the entire, my entire life. I, I fear pushing people away, whatever it might be. Those fears are often the things that we have to be resilient from and they are common challenges that hinder our resilience as well. So it's kind of a double kick up the ass, the old fear. So, And then there's shame. You know, We talked a little bit about shame before, but shame is a debilitating, crappy thing that, that is almost always in the voice of someone else. It's always, almost always the voice of a neglectful parent, a, a hurtful partner, um, someone in a school teacher someone in our life someone in our school life in our childhood that when we were growing up and our brain was forming were were really quite mean to us or limiting to us and 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 as a result we limit ourselves with their words that is almost always what shame 
is sounds like you know um and there's lots of good work on shame that that you could look into um obviously Brene Brown's TED talk on shame is is I think still the most watched TED talk and there's a reason for that shame and vulnerability she talks about and it is awesome man it's so good any of her writing and any of her teaching is awesome but um yeah I would I would highly recommend that that's another common challenge is shame the other and another com- common challenge to that hinders our resilience is is our negative self-talk as I said before the way that we speak about ourselves you know even even to the point where and I, I talk to my clients a lot about this like even to the point where sometimes you'll stub your toe or kick your shin or drop a pen that you're using or or I don't know something right and you go oh you fucking idiot right to yourself what you're saying is I'm an idiot for doing that for making that mistake right for that tiny tiny little mistake and you're and you're throwing yourself out for that right you put yourself in the bin for making a tiny little mistake that's important I know it doesn't seem like much but it is a hugely impactful thing when it when it mounts up when it compounds the negative self-talk is a big thing and, and we, can, we can combat all of those things by just reframing our negative thoughts, reframing how we speak about ourselves negatively, you know, practicing some self-compassion, right? Uh, yeah, I kicked my shin and that really hurt and I wish I hadn't done it. But why was it there? Why, you know, why is that thing there? I, I, whatever, right? Or I could have changed it and I didn't or, you know, it's okay to make mistakes, these are the things we tell our kids. If you're a parent, I'm sure you've told your kids it's okay to make mistakes, blah, blah. But you don't tell yourself that <laughs> because, you know, for some reason we have to be perfect and it, it's just futile that. So, you know, I think practicing self-compassion, reframing negative thoughts and also then, you know, seeking professional help if you need to get through that as well. These, these are ways that you can overcome the obstacles and, and kickstart your resilience. But that's the point. It has to be kickstarted. And remember, I I do think it's in all of us. Different levels maybe, but it is in all of us. And we just need to be able to find it. We we need to be able to find the thing that triggers our resilience and we can build from that. All right, so today I've got an academic academic paper as I always have. I want to to include a... uh, a peer-reviewed scientific paper each time I make these episodes and it's about the theme and so for you to either have a look at if you want or not, whatever's up, it's up to you. But today's paper is entitled Predictors of Resilience After Negative Life Events, The Role of Optimism, Social Support and Cognitive Flexibility. So it was published in the Journal of Health Psychology in 2021. So it's really recent and I'll put the link to the paper in the show notes so you can have a look at yourself. But it is so good in terms of being relevant to what we're talking about today. You know, it explores the predictors of resilience after a negative life experience, a negative life event, right? What is, what is the thing that, that either people recognize they need to be resilient from or the trigger that, that triggers their, um, their resilience? Um, and it specifically focuses on the role of being optimistic and the role of social support around you, and then how you can be fl- um, cognitively flexible. So how you can change your mindset, basically. The three things that we've talked about um, so far in this, in this episode. And in this paper, which is, which is really quite, quite um, easy to read, it's, it, you know, it's really well written, the authors found that all of those three factors are positively associated with, resi- with resilience. In other words, um, social support, cognitive flexibility, and... Um, optimism are all positively associated which means they promote um, resilience in, in a person and can can be helpful in resilience and the paper also showed that that cognitive cognitive flexibility so being able to change your mindset um, mediated the relationship between social support and resilience so it is doubly important to be able to be aware of your mindset and to be able to be flexible in your mindset even change your mindset um, but to have that growth mindset, not to be stuck in um, the mindset that says, well, I'm a failure, so I fail, um, but instead to be in the mindset of, you know, I've made a mistake, so how do, I, how do I come away from that? What can I learn from it? How do I build from it? Um, and then it, it provides some really specific uh, insights into specific factors that can help people build their resilience after experiencing setbacks and and yeah it's a really worthwhile read there's lots of scientific sort of 
jargon in there too at the first bit. But if you get past that, um, then it's really it's really quite useful for giving you some strategies and tips, um, you know, to be able to build your resilience and to come back from setbacks that you've experienced in your life too. And now finally, I'm going to just give you some tips and strategies on how to build your resilience. How, how do we actually do this this week? So after listening to this episode, I've, you know, I've listened to his episode, I've got this setback in my life, I, I need some takeaways, I need some things to implement this week. So here's eight of them, okay? Number one, practice self-care. Taking care of yourself physically, emotionally and mentally is essential really for building resilience. Um, includes things like getting enough sleep, uh, eating a balanced diet, getting some regular movement and exercise, um, engaging in meaningful activities, uh, thing, doing things that bring you joy. All of those things are crucial to self-care and self-care is crucial to resilience. So that's number one. Number two, cultivate a growth mindset even if you don't have one even if you've never had one a growth mindset is the belief again that you can learn and grow from challenges and setbacks you can you can do something about it you're not fixed right um practicing uh, reframing your negative self-talk is a good way to do that focus on opportunities for growth opportunities to learn from things be curious be brave right all of those things uh, a way to cultivate a growth mindset, even if you've never had one before. Number three, build social support, right? Having, and this is ironic coming from me, I know, but having a supportive network and family, friends, colleagues around you who can help you through tough times is important. Make time to connect with others, whether it's in person or online like this, um, and ask for help when you need it. You know, it's such a simple thing when you say it out loud, but I know it's a lot less simple than that so but you know whatever you can do to build social support will help you build your resilience i i guarantee it number four practice mindfulness mindfulness is the practice of being present of being in the moment um and really being non-judgmental of that moment right so just being able to put yourself to center yourself to ground yourself in a place and not go oh god i'm here again or why am i always here or any of that but just be able to go yep I'm here. This is where I am, right? And incorporating mindfulness practices like meditation as I do or deep breathing or breath work or just being concentrated on a smell, something you can smell, something you can hear, something you can uh, taste, something you can touch. All of those things bring you to the present moment and all of those things can help you manage stress and build resilience from a setback. Um, This is not my opinion. It's not magic. It's science. Um, Practicing mindfulness helps big time in building resilience as does set setting realistic goals so number five is set realistic goals setting achievable goals and working towards them can help build confidence and build your resilience you know breaking larger goals into smaller segmented goals manageable steps and celebrating your progress along the way i've said before in other episodes and i say to my clients a lot we're not we're not trying to eat the elephant in one sitting we're we're just going to start with the hooves right set yourself a little goal Work towards that goal, track your progress towards that goal, and most importantly, celebrate the achievement of that goal. Little wins. Celebrating little wins, super, super important because if you're only waiting for the big win, you're going to wait a long time and you're going to have a lot of setbacks from which you can't be resilient, from which you can't be resilient, and you're probably not going to reach the bigger, bigger goal because of that, right? So set realistic goals, small, manageable goals, track your progress celebrate your wins number seven uh, sorry number six practice gratitude right focusing on what you're grateful for even when times are really difficult um, can help you build resilience try starting a journal maybe or a, a, just a practice of being able to either write down what you're grateful for a couple of times a day one time a day once a week i don't care or even just that when you lie down to go to bed at night what were you grateful for happening today um, and when you wake up in the morning, just the simple, the simple process of waking up, opening your eyes and being grateful for being alive. You know, there's a lot of people who would swap, <laughs> swap you today um, for, the, for the honor and the privilege to be able to wake up alive and move and get out of bed and do something worthwhile and meaningful. Um, so to be grateful for that, you know, I always think isn't that hard. But 
Some days it is. Some days it is for me too. But, you know, I'm, I'm trying and I work hard on that. And I'd love you to work hard on that too. Number seven of eight is to embrace challenges. Not to, not to run away from things. Facing challenges and taking risks can help you build resilience, right? It can help you build resilience over time, practicing stepping out of your comfort zone, trying new things, being comfortable with being uncomfortable, even if it feels really, really uncomfortable and you're really fighting against that. This is, these are all really important factors, really important things. And to embrace your challenges will show that you can and show that you have and and resilience is muscle memory it's something you've done before that you can remember you can do again right and it's really important that you are focused on what you're able to do what you've been able to do before so embracing challenges is a great way to build your resilience and then lastly seeking help from a, from a professional like me or somebody else if you need to if you're struggling to build the resilience on your own um Sometimes it's just being able to have someone to steer you, to guide you, to listen to you, to give you help with determining those, those smaller goals, right? To be able to manage, to chunk down your goals into manageable steps, to be able to track your progress and help you celebrate your wins, to be able to help you gain some mindfulness, you know, to be able to reframe how you speak and how you think about yourself into something much more positive and much more functional and much more healthy. Right? And, and sometimes that happens with the help of a mental health professional. Sometimes it's just a really good friend or someone you can speak to. But if you're struggling to do it on your own, um, then I'd really encourage you to reach out to somebody um, who is a mental health professional who will do that in a non-judgmental way, in a non-judgmental um, environment, which will help too. And they can offer you that support and guidance and other tools that will help you build your resilience too. Okay, so they're the eight things that I think you can take this week and run with them in order to build your resilience. I hope that if you have suffered a setback and you are trying to be resilient from it, that this helps and that you're able to do one or eight of those things um, this week in order to start to build your resilience and start to create your comeback, right? I think we all have a right to be happy and safe and content. We all have resilience at some level and depth within us some people access it easier than others and some people can access it more often and to a greater degree than others but it's there for all of us we have to work on it though it is muscle memory it is something you have to work towards it is something you have to try hard to first identify through self-compassion through self-acceptance through being able to say yes i made a mistake but i can learn from it the growth mindset as opposed to the fixed mindset and i really hope you're able to use some of this to move forward um, from today and start to build your resilience more greatly and more often. I hope you're having a great day wherever you are uh, and you can build some resilience, spend some kindness on yourself today and, uh, and try to be the best version of yourself today and tomorrow. All right, hooroo.